and really laid the foundation for that, anticipated that, and the research, I think, strongly <coughs> supports that. The third thing he did, which is really important, as you all know, there's a vast range of <coughs> material going on between religion and spirituality and all of that kind of stuff. Bernie's initial research really focused upon what in his textbook he calls the Pauline model of conversion, an experience that occurs suddenly. And <coughs> some of those experiences, under the conditions that we specified, can be and indeed are mystical experiences and are variously interpreted. But we also know there's another kind of, of, of conversion, a kind of gradual conversion that occurs among seekers. And among people who are gradually converted by seeking for spiritual domains, we know two things. They report much higher frequencies of mystical experiences, and they are able to easily and, and with a kind of fluidity frame them in various structures. And so that, that part of that driving force of that spiritual seeking is experiential based and then framing that in a variety of ways, which leads to what many people have speculated and then documented empirically. That wonderful for some people and <coughs> uh, amazingly disturbing for others, uh, eclecticism of New Age spirituality. And Bernie again laid a, a framework <coughs> within which that makes sense. I'm dying. The third, fourth thing, <laughs> the, the fourth thing that I, that I want to emphasize, and the only thing where I disagree uh, a bit with Bernie on, uh, and that's a persistent bias that's been in the field, uh, in which the, the model of mysticism can address, and that is in his original study, uh, Bernie threw out two people because they indicated their, their experiences were drug-induced. And now there's a vast literature in fact, the best experimental literature in the psychology of religion deals with the facilitation of religious and mystical experiences with the use of what now people call ethiogens, but what's most systematically been investigated is psilocybin. And the best current two studies done by Griffiths at John Hopkins University, they used established measures of mysticism and showed that with appropriate set and settings you can facilitate the occurrence of mystical experiences, which are then religiously framed and found both to be meaningful and empirically identical to experiences that are not identified as being elicited by drugs. So there's four areas in which Bernie had carved out some foundational stuff for which there's a significant body of empirical work that is theory-driven with respect to mysticism. Now, for the future, I just want to mention two things in the time I have left, briefly. Um, there has been um, a huge call for, and, and uh, Lucian is here, he's one of the people who's called for it. The, the catchphrase, which I love, because I'm going to use it to hang everyone with, is this, this multi-level, non-reductive, right, interdisciplinary paradigm for the psychology of religion. What about this? And what's beautiful about that is Two things are happening in the study of mysticism. We are returning to the earlier days of psychology where the experimenter was also the subject. <clears throat> so think of the debate that occupies religious studies people especially. Is there a commonality to experience independent of interpretation? And all of that notion that there can't be an experience is not already interpreted. We will let that slide for a second. But what is happening now is that empirical investigators in the psychology of mysticism are going, are going into their own spiritual steps to elicit mystical experience and then communicate among themselves about the nature of that experience. And we have scholars, and I won't mention their names now, in the Zen tradition, in Hindu traditions, in Christian traditions, in Jewish mystical traditions, all saying that when the mystical experience, however we want to define it for a second, is elicited, the individuals for whom the experience is elicited argue that it is identical, it is the same. Now, that's William James said a long time ago that the experience of mysticism is absolutely authoritative for the person who has it. And it's a source of hypothesis for the people who don't have it. But now what we have is the people who have it 
saying it's the same, and then using established measures of mysticism across the tradition from other people, also saying it's the same. So now we have first person people saying it's the same, we can communicate, and empirically third person objective data saying it's the same and we can communicate, and that's going to be part of the future of the psychology of religion. And so, in the last two minutes, if we return to the paradigm, right, I had a delightful experience last night where, where Bernie took me through the tour of his library, and it is impressive. It's been my position for years that psychologists don't read, or better yet, they read journals. And you go into Bernie's <laughs> library, and you go into Bernie's library, and it is loaded with books, not just in the psychology of religion, but psychology, history, philosophy. I mean, I wanted to load up my truck and steal. <laughs> so here's my argument. Bernie is a, an illuminary in flesh of the new paradigm of the past. He is read. He's never accepted a, a reductive interpretation of religion. He knows that broader, interdisciplinary, multi-level stuff you need to do if you're going to be a psychologist of religion. And what's even better, he's a shining light for the future. Because my argument is that if you're a psychologist of religion, I should be able to go into your lab and to your into your office, and you ought to have more books than journals. <laughs> <laughs> We have some time for questions for Professor Hood. Not from journal editors, though. So. They have books. They have books. <laughs> yes. So, um, in what sense are drug abuse experiences or any mystical experience or different kinds of Christian mystical experiences, in what sense are those identical? The, the, the easiest way to say that is an experience of undifferentiated beauty. I mean, because the literature seems to speak against that. No, no, the literature has a pendulum history from the, the, what I call the common core unity theorists, you know, Stace and James and those. Then the rejoinder by Katz and the social constructionists. Then the return by Foreman and others. And the, the way to solve that is nobody has ever argued James or states included that attributions are not, you know, our language is not part of the structuring of experience, but it says two things. It mainly is a factor in identifying the interpretation of experience, and it never is a factor in totally constructing the experience. So from James on, there's a pre-linguistic ontological apprehension of reality that is then linguistic. 